from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I am Estefania Bravo. This is from the South. Authorities in Colombia opened fire on indigenous rights defenders in the Cauca region, reportedly wounding six of them. Indigenous communities have denounced the attacks by Colombia's right-wing government, but authorities are blaming so-called FARC dissidents for the attack. One police officer is dead. However, these images are further evidence of the repression being carried out by Duque's government against the social and popular Minga work group. Meanwhile, thousands of people have marched in Colombia to protest against the president's calls to revise a law to regulate the special jurisdiction for peace. Protesters rejected Duque's plans to modify six out of 159 articles in the law that would, uh, add, that would aid in implementing the 2016 peace accord with the FARC. This jurisdiction helped create a court to investigate crimes committed during the internal conflict. In Mozambique, United Nations has begun distributing aid in the areas hit by Cyclone Idai. International organizations say the Buzi district was flooded after a river burst and they fear thousands could get trapped over the next 24 hours. Meanwhile, the city of Bayram has no power and aid workers are struggling to reach the city as roads have been cut off. Many are still clinging to rooftops waiting to be rescued. The president has said more than 200 people have been killed in the storm. See around us, it's uh, atrocious weather conditions, the weather is still persisting and uh, despite that everybody is helping and we're offloading 20 tons of cargo manually by hand because they have been by United Nations officials say Cyclone Adai is possibly the worst weather related disaster ever to strike the southern hemisphere. About 1.7 million people are in the path of the cyclone in Mozambique, while over 900,000 people are affected in Malawi. In Mozambique, floods have surged up to 6 meters in many areas, and several dams are almost at maximum capacity. And neighbor in Zimbabwe was also hit by the cyclone, or corresponding in capital Harare has more details about the situation there. Three Southern African countries, Malawi, Mozambique and Zimbabwe, they are counting their losses. The three countries have been affected by Cyclone Adai, which has left a trail of destruction in all three countries. It originated from the Mozambican coast and now Mozambican President Felipe Nyusi has said over a thousand people have been killed and the city of Beira has been left desolate. And now in Zimbabwe, the cyclone has also affected parts of the eastern islands in the country where infrastructure and lives have been lost. But the government of Zimbabwe has put in $50 million towards rescue and relief efforts. It has also called in the army to help with the rescue operations. Ordinary people have also come on board and they are saying they want to help the government in order to lessen the burden as many people they've been expecting the government to play a critical role. But others are also saying it is also the role of ordinary people in the civic community and other corporate organizations. The government is saying all channels and all resources should make sure that we bring relief and help to the people who have been affected. And as it is, more people they are coming together in order to ascertain that people they have a better livelihood food has been brought to the people they have been affected and also the issues to do with infrastructure and earlier we spoke with journalist Njubulo Nube from Zimbabwe who explained why many are criticizing the government's response to the disaster the, the people believe that they should have acted earlier because the, the warning signs were there uh, the the the, the government was told uh, last week that uh, Zimbabwe will be, uh, 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 will be attacked by this cyclone. Uh, it was a concentration area, but uh, they didn't take uh, uh, measures 
to try and evacuate people from the low-lying regions, hence the criticism. Uh, and secondly, uh, the fact that the president flew out to, uh, to, to Dubai uh, uh, when the cyclone started hitting hard the low-lying areas is another issue which uh, people are not happy about. Moving on, people in Venezuela have marched to denounce foreign intervention in their country's affairs. Our correspondent in Caracas, Luis Tavera, reports. Venezuelans are taking to the streets and social media to protest against the international attack on their country, joining the government statement that condemns foreign powers seeking to destabilize the socialist system that Venezuela has been enjoying for the last 20 years. And many countries, like Russia and several political organizations, continue to show solidarity with the Venezuelan people. Recently, the country has also suffered from a complex attack on the national electric system that brought massive power outages to the whole country, affecting millions of Venezuelans. But people's resistance and strong will to maintain peace and tranquility have helped the nation to overcome this difficult situation. Meanwhile, on social media, many people, especially the media, have tried to paint a picture of Venezuela as a country full of tension and violence, even though reality is the complete opposite, peace and tranquility. Citizens fully understand the seriousness of the situation they are currently living in, that the attack on the electricity was coming from outside forces. However, life in Venezuela has already returned to normal, and electricity has been fully restored. We thank Luis Tavera for that report. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has met with his U.S. counterpart Donald Trump at the White House. Trump says he is strongly considering a NATO membership for Brazil. The U.S. president is also supporting Brazil's efforts to join the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. The meeting between the two leaders seals a new alliance between their right-wing governments. Going to present that. Uh, the relationship that we have right now with Brazil has never been better. I think there was a lot of hostility with other presidents. There's zero hostility with me. And we were going, we're going to look at that very, very strongly in terms of uh, whether it's NATO or it's uh, something having to do with uh, alliance. Uh, but we have a great alliance with Brazil, better than we've ever had before. Meanwhile, Cuba's Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez is criticizing Trump, who warned Tuesday that the U.S. could impose tougher sanctions on Venezuela. Rodriguez said, quote, I strongly reject and condemn President Trump's McCarthyism and imperialistic reiteration of the Monroe Doctrine. Cuba will continue to be free and socialist and will stand in solidarity with Venezuela against threats implied in phrase, all options are on the table. Our correspondent Alina Duarte was there and gives us the details. Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro is here in Washington in his first visit as head of state. The president's agenda has included a visit to the CIA headquarters, which was described by Bolsonaro's son as an excellent opportunity to discuss political topics of the region. Bolsonaro also visited the Chamber of Commerce, where he recalled that in the past Brazil was an enemy of the U.S., and now he is a friend that admires the U.S. Bolsonaro also visited the OAS, where he met with Secretary General Luis Almagro. The common denominator of Bolsonaro's visit to the U.S. has been Venezuela, and for sure he will discuss it also with President Trump. Among other topics, Bolsonaro has mentioned that he always wanted to free Brazil from the leftist ideology. We thank Alina for that report. An Ecuadorian judge has accepted our request to investigate President Lenin Moreno in connection to a corruption case. 153 public officials will be called to testify in a case that involves President Moreno and his family. They have been linked to various cases of money laundering and corruption in the purchase of a luxury apartment in Alicante, Spain, among other high-end purchases. The hearing will be held on April 1st. And now to South Africa, where residents are dealing with constant power outages due to cuts. Our correspondent in South Africa, Matuba Malachi, has the latest. South Africa's only power supplier, ESCOM, is now operating on crisis mode. ESCOM has introduced rotational power cuts around the country known as load shedding. So at any given time, parts of the country would be without electricity for up to four hours, some parts even more hours than just four hours. And this has been a reality for many South Africans for the past two weeks. And it was confirmed on Tuesday afternoon that the situation may get worse before 
there's a permanent solution. Now, corruption and gross mismanagement uh, are said to be behind the crisis. And President Cyril Ramaphosa, when he came into office, intervened, appointing a new ESCOM board, but that has not yielded any results. And all South Africans are hearing at this point is how billions of dollars were looted from the power utility under former President Jacob Zuma's watch. Judging from public outrage, these power, uh, these power cuts that we are seeing today in South Africa on a daily basis may cost the governing party in the upcoming elections. It's back to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Matuba. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. One student was killed and another was wounded in a shooting in a Peruvian school. Local media is reporting that police sources have said the shooting may have been an accident. They said it happened after a boy brought his father's firearm to the school. First we didn't hear a shooting, we just heard something fall, and then teachers started feeling nervous, but they wouldn't explain, and after that the psychologist came and explained us what had happened, and it was then when we understood what had just happened. The Development Bank of Latin America, CAF, has approved a $200 million loan to improve Trinidad and Tobago's road network. The loan will be used to construct an overpass as well as rehabilitate and maintain roads. The bank's president, Luis Carranza, says the quality of roads and transport services are crucial to boosting Trinidad and Tobago's economic development. In the passage of time, will emerge... The Trinidad and Tobago Police Service is incorporating sports as a crime-fighting tool. A new youth football tournament titled the Commissioner's Cup aims to engage youngsters, build their skills, and positively influence behavior. Several stakeholders, including the Trinidad and Tobago Football Federation, are on board with the initiative, which kick up, um, kicks off in July. Well to be in those communities. We're hoping to put together with the Commissioner's Cup a number of opportunities, pathways for kids to better themselves, to get to a situation whereby through football and education, and the education side of it is so important. And with the Commissioner's Cup, I think the greater social aspect is giving these kids the, the idea that they can be greater, they can see and do something greater outside of their community and also make them better human beings. Guyana's Ethnic Relations Commission has found no evidence of ethnic preference in the hiring practices of the country's elections commission. Opposition commissioners filed a complaint regarding the hiring of Deputy Chief Elections Officer Roxanne Myers. Myers, who is Africo Guyanese, was appointed even though she scored lower than sitting Deputy Chief Bishnu Prasad, who is Indo Guyanese. The probe revealed that Prasad was not selected due to questions of character, credibility, and integrity. The report also concluded that because of the way Guyana's population is distributed, a majority of those employees would be mainly of one ethnicity. An aviation security specialist has defended the pilots currently on trial in the south of France who were accused of trying to, traf uh, to traffic drugs. The witness told the court the case was a setup. Two former French Air Force pilots went on trial in France on Monday, six years after they fled the Dominican Republic following a drugs bust on a private jet in the Caribbean nation. Dominican police found the narcotics packets in, pack, packed into 26 suitcases on board a Falcon 50 jet as they prepared to, ply, to fly from the Dominican to France. I expect the court, if it so wishes, obviously, and I do not presume its decision, to totally exonerate Mr. Foray and Mr. Oros, who have absolutely nothing to do with this case, which is a setup, a fictitious case of the Dominican Republic. In Costa Rica, indigenous leader Sergio Rojas is dead after being shot 15 times. Rojas defended the territories of the Bribri de Salitre community located in the south of the country. The UN High Commission for Human Rights in Costa Rica has called for a thorough investigation. Our correspondent in San Jose, Fernando Francia, has more details. 
groups are showing solidarity with the indigenous community and with Sergio Rojas. All of the communities in Salitre have been meeting together to decide further action after Rojas died Monday night after being shot 15 times. A reaction president is expected. Here, there are organizations like Serpad, Urain, and other environmental and feminist movements. All the social movements are showing their solidarity with the community and social leader Sergio Rojas. He was very active in land recovery. For these communities that have lost almost 40% of the land that had belonged to them by law since 1977, but that landlords, not indigenous people, have been occupying little by little in the south of the country. This gathering is set to continue. We thank Fernando for that report. The World Bank has approved $27 million to help construct a geothermal power plant in Dominica. The plant would provide power to around 23,000 homes. Dominica has a small power system that relies heavily on diesel to produce electricity. The island's electricity rate is among the highest in the world. The government has so far invested around $18 million in the project. The U.S. has shortened the duration of visitor visas granted to Cubans. The measure went into effect on Monday and it reduces the validity of B-2 tourism visas from five years to three months. Cuban President Miguel Diaz Camel has called the move an act of aggression. The limit on issuing visas actually makes Cubans difficult to see their relatives in the United States. Moreover, it also increased economic burdens of those who have to frequently shuttle between Cuba and United States. The decision has restricted those on clothes selling and catering business from stocking goods of the United States. Now the private entrepreneurs in Cuba have to go to other countries for goods, which may add unnecessary expenses on them. Last week, St. Lucia put its tsunami preparedness and response plans to the test. Thousands of, of school students took part in a tsunami drill. Our correspondent, Alison Ketnish, has more. With the Caribbean being rocked by tremors over the past few months, authorities are taking serious steps to improve preparedness and assess tsunami response plans. CARIBWAVE, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission tsunami exercise, is seeking to improve tsunami warning system effectiveness, particularly in at-risk coastal communities. Here in St. Lucia, the exercise is based on a magnitude 6.0 earthquake associated with an eruption of the underwater volcano Kikamjeni off Grenada, which then generates a tsunami predicted to impact the west coast of St. Lucia. In the capital Castries, a major focus is on the readiness of schools, where over 3,000 people took part. This is our first time taking part in this activity and so we had to attend um, first there was an on-site meeting and then we had a webinar to prepare us where we met with um, other countries persons from other countries around the region as we prepared for this and um, there is an evaluation exercise afterwards to determine just how well we all did with the activity the school authorities say thanks to the drill the students know what to do in the event of a tsunami our school did excellently this morning. We were able to clear the school after doing all of our sweeps, make sure nobody was left behind in a time of one minute and five seconds. We were able to get to our assembly point in five minutes, 28 seconds. The exercise tested the efficiency of systems from detection and forecast to public information dissemination and response. As St. Lucia is located between two faulty tectonic plates, which makes the island prone to tsunami generating earthquakes, the exercise was meant to build resilience and reduce loss of life. Alison Kentish, Telesor, St. Lucia. The defeated main opposition candidate in Nigeria has challenged the election result. Atiku Abubaka has filed a legal challenge to last month's vote. The candidate for the People's Democratic Party has asked that the Electoral Commission overturns the result on the ground of irregularities. Mohamedou Buhari from the All Progressives Congress was elected for a second term on February 23rd. 
Health professionals and workers in Algeria have marched on the streets of the capital, Algiers, demanding that President Abdelaziz Bouteflika steps down. As the country commemorates the end of the War of Independence, protesters called for the president to step down amid fears he will extend his two-decade rule. Bouteflika announced last week he would not stand for another term, but on Tuesday, he said he would stay in office until a new constitution is adopted. Under no circumstances will we accept the extension of the fit mandate, nor will we accept that the transition be done under the authority of this regime. We have had several experiences in the past where all the attempts were driven by those in power, and we have seen where that led us. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back. The anti-venom shortage that Kenya is currently suffering is causing hundreds of deaths. Although snake anti-venoms are effective and can be produced at scale, experts blame the weak production capacity, feeble policy, and high prices for its scarcity. Doctors Without Borders described the anti-venom shortage as a public health crisis. See, Fava Freak um, pro stopped producing anti-venom because there's no money. And the problem is, as the world doesn't look at this problem, it is the poor person at the end of the line in the community that cannot afford it that's the person that's bitten. But unfortunately, they're not the customer. They're actually the end user. And therefore, governments and the international community really should pick that up because it's the right thing to do. Kenyans have accused their government of ignoring drought victims following reports that at least 10 people have died due to hunger in the Turkana region. The hashtag we could not ignore was, has been trending, calling for action from the government. The government confirmed that about 1 million people are facing food shortages because of the prolonged droughts. At least 10 migrants lost their lives on Tuesday when their bo boat sank off the Libyan coast near the western town of Sabrafa. Security officials said 17 others were rescued and transferred to the hospital. According to a survivor from Sudan, the boat was carrying about 27 migrants who set off from Suwara, a northwestern town of Libya. We arrived in the middle of the water. The captain said, we can't continue. The side of the wave hit us. Two children died, two newborn babies. Myself, my leg broke. Girls with broken legs, pregnant women were stuck in the water. UN war crimes investigators have called on Israel to stop its snipers from using lethal force against protesters in the Gaza Strip. The investigator said there is an urgent need for Israel to review its rules of engagement because the current ones do not conform to international law. A report by the UN revealed that Israeli troops killed 189 Palestinians and wounded more than 6,000 during protests between March 30th and December 31st of 2018. <laughs> The Ethiopian government has postponed the national census due to a large number of people left, by homeless, uh, left homeless by conflict in parts of the country. Most people fled their homes because of the largely ethnic-driven conflict. The census is vital to determine the country's population and would influence the allocation of budgets for each region. The country has postponed the census twice, in 2017 and 2018. Ethiopia carried out its last census in 2007. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation has condemned the decision by an Israeli court to extend the closure of the Bab al Rama Mosque in the occupied city of East Jerusalem. On Sunday, the Jerusalem Mag Magistrates Court accepted a request by the Israeli Attorney General to review the closure of the mosque. It's one of several mosques located in Jerusalem's Al-Aqsa Mosque complex. The, o uh, the OIC said the court's judgment was a violation of international law and the Geneva Convention. Hundreds of people took to the streets of Sacramento, California in the U.S. demanding justice for Stephon Clark. He was shot and killed by police one year ago. Protesters held banners and chanted Black Lives Matter, remembering the 22-year-old who was shot at least seven times in his grandmother's backyard. The two officers responsible claimed 
Clark was armed, but later found out he was actually holding a mobile phone. The two officers were found not guilty by Sacramento County's district attorney on March 2nd. There's an epidemic in uh, the United States of police uh, taking the lives of black men, uh, not caring about it, sweeping under the rug, telling lies about us, and then slandering us when we're dead. It needs to stop. And with that story, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also join us on social media. We are on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.